Welcome back. The plate is set for today's roundtable, and we have a lot to digest. Some introductions first. Anthony Mann is the veteran political reporter for the Sun Sentinel. Carolyn Gunnis, the executive editor of the Miami Times and president of the South Florida Black Journalists Association. Mark Caputo covers Florida politics for Politico and writes the daily Politico Florida playbook. Did we all have an interesting week? We sure did. Yes, we did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Andrew Gillum. <laughs> yeah, and Ron DeSantis, too, I think, in a lot of ways. And so, okay, no. Well, we knew DeSantis was going to win. Uh, but we just didn't we, know that big. Well, that Ron DeSantis' poll showed that he was going to win by 19. And the president, when he spoke in Virginia, West Virginia, he mentioned Ron DeSantis, said Ron DeSantis would win by 19. And Ron DeSantis won by 19. Well, let's talk about those polls. That's, a, that's an interesting number. Do, do we believe polls anymore after 2016 and then Tuesday night? Carolyn, do we believe those? Do we? I certainly have lost a lot of faith have in you? polls because, um, you know, up until election day, they were saying uh, Andrew Gillum was polling at 12 percent and um, he now came in at 33 percent. So I'm not sure who it is that they're calling. Um, I think we were talking about um, perhaps they're calling people who vote, but he was on the campaign trail trying to get people who don't vote to come out and vote. That's an interesting perspective. The, okay. the polls are useful tools, but they're not everything. And we put, uh, we generally, uh, in this kind of political world that we're all in, generally put too much stock in them, but they provide some useful information, but you have to take into account what kind of uh, assumptions are they making about who's going to turn out. Uh, gubernatorial primary polls, at least according to the people at 538.com, are historically inaccurate. Uh, general election polls are a little, generally a little higher quality, so it really depends on what you mean by the polls. Yeah, and we, we never really look at, when we talk about polls, we don't really look at which what the scientific breakdown is of each poll. We don't ever report much of that. It's a little more difficult also, to Anthony's point, in a Democratic primary especially. The Democratic tent is uh, bigger and far less white than the Republican tent. The, the other thing that polls are not very good tools for is gauging real excitement and enthusiasm. And as 20 years as a reporter in this state covering politics almost full time, I have never seen a Democratic candidate on the gubernatorial ballot generate as much excitement as Andrew Gillum did leading up to the election and then after. I mean, he is a dynamic candidate who might prove the conventional wisdom wrong in the general election that you can't win as a progressive, that Florida is a center-right state. We're going to see. Well, if Florida then is a center-right state and a third of Florida voters did not vote in the primaries, could not as, as NPAs, as no party affiliation, Carolyn, how does each of these men who have a very pure, undiluted philosophy of their party appeal to people who don't? I think they have to pick up, pick up the candidates who have that viewpoint. So I think uh, Gillum will have to uh, bring uh, Gwen Graham along and, and ask for those voters to, to come and join him. And DeSantis will also have to find that other group that uh, you know is right in the middle and, and ask them to come along with him. And the truth is most of those voters who are NPA are really inclined to vote Democratic or Republican. They're NPA by registration, but there really aren't that many who are that moderate and that swayable to vote for either side. But if you are, uh, you know, you can be Democrat but not be a progressive, not think about things that are being framed as socialism. You can be a Republican but not buy into maybe the social conservatism of a Republican. That's true, but understand the game that Republicans have won at in the state for 20 years, which is in primaries or in their campaigns. They campaign as like, I am the hard right, true red conservative. And the Democrats might campaign initially as like the true blue progressive liberal guy, but they are then instinctively told that once there is a midterm general election, that we have to appeal to the middle. That's and the Republicans the do very little of that, and they win. So what Democrats might have internalized this time, either intentionally, unintentionally, consciously, or unconsciously, is like, why do we have to play this game of reaching out to the middle when it doesn't seem that the middle cares very much about what we're trying to sell when we try to sell it to them, and the middle seems to break just a little more for the Republicans? 
Yeah. And that was certainly a Gillum argument that he was making all yeah. during the, the primary campaign was why go and do the same thing again and again that we've been doing unsuccessfully for 20 years. I mean, think about the history again. I mean, we, we've had five white centrist Democratic nominees, and now we have a black progressive at the top of the ticket for Democrats. It's really historical. So how much then does race play into this election? I think it plays some because uh, the Democrats have been asking for some sort of representation up ticket, um, some real representation. And now they have not only Gillum, but they also have uh, Sean Shaw. So, you know, it's, I think now they feel like they've been heard. Um, they have a seat at the table. And I think that's going to drive more black voters out to vote. So I think race is going to play an important part. And so now that we, you know, I've seen Ron DeSantis already come out and say, hey, listen, you know, I love that I have the support of the president and it's made me known. But right now I can think of a couple of things that I don't agree with him on. Is he already distancing himself from the president? Well, to a degree. But in the end, even if Ron DeSantis did not want Trump to be his running mate, Trump is his running mate. There's only so far he can get away with it. And there's only so far he's inclined to get away from it as well. And well, he also proved that this week with the foolishness that he did, starting with the dog whistle uh, racist comment. I mean, we've been throwing this word around dog whistle. I mean, people have to you know, understand that you know, when you blow a whistle and the dog hears, he responds. And the response was that we end up with these negative robocalls that, that, that came out, the racist ones, uh, using a voice that sounds like Gillum. I and mean, that, that it was, was a, and to be fair, that was a, a totally different and unrelated But it, it's issue. the dog whistle. That's it. It was a call to act this way, and someone acted on it. Mm. That's right. exactly and, what a dog whistle does. And, and just for people just tuning in, for the record, the DeSantis campaign said it was absurd to think that that was racial. So. Anyway, there's uh, another race we need to talk about. Uh, Governor Scott, Senator Nelson, now officially, officially set. And we'll talk about that when we come right back. Welcome back to the round table. You know, the, uh, the Senate race now set. I, Governor Rick Scott actually had a primary challenger that no one really talked about, at least, you know, in our little world too much. But Mark, Rocky De La Fuente got 10% of the vote. Was, is that surprising or am I uh, no, imagining things? It sounds kind of surprising. I, the total number is about 190,000 votes in a GOP primary. It looked like a protest vote. The really interesting county there is Martin County, which is one of the hardest hit by the toxic algae crisis. Uh -huh. And Republican voters there broke 20% for the unknown Republican, Rocky De La Fuente, over the governor. Governor Rick Scott has been under fire for forcing South Florida, Florida Water Management District, Water Man Management Districts to cut their budgets, which could have affected water quality management as well as uh, their broader mandate, as well as reducing other regulations concerning water quality. In fact, when he first got in office, Governor Rick Scott made sure that uh, the state took over from EPA monitoring water quality. And, and, and it looks like there is a political problem here. I'm not blaming Rick Scott for the, the poison, the toxicity, but it looks like a political problem and it looks like it manifested itself in Martin County. And it looks like he might understand that because Governor Scott has been front and center in Martin County trying to sort of find a solution, being very proactive, inviting the press to see. And so it looks like he knows that this is going to be something he needs to contend with as a campaign issue. Absolutely. Uh, he, it's clearly the kind of thing he doesn't want to be associated with. He doesn't want to be the guy that people are holding responsible for uh, the uh, algae problem. But it's been going on for years and under his watch, so I'm not sure how he could distance himself from it. Yeah, it erupted twice, uh, in 2013, giving rise to Amendment 1 in 2014, right. and then this year. I grew up in this state. I grew up in South Florida. I don't remember anyone being able to pick up a mason jar of what's supposed to be water and pour it out, and it looks like guacamole. And the fact that it's a very complicated environmental issue, and, it, and it's sort of being... Um, conflated with the red tide on the Gulf Coast, which, which really has nothing to do with the same kind of um, chemicals, characteristics. There are some okay. arguments to be made, and I'm not a scientist, so I'll you plead play that. One on TV. <laughs> there are arguments to be made that while the red tide that's occurring on the West Coast is actually linked to the Mississippi River and perhaps even pollutants as far as away as Iowa, that nearshore pollution from the shores in Florida help 
feed and further that red tide. So while they are natural occurring phenomenon, they're being exacerbated by inputs from the Mississippi River and possibly even from Florida near shore waters. Yeah. All right. Well, back to the uh, the Senate race. You know, we are already seeing some of the advertising and um, it looks like the Scott campaign is really going to sort of push this subliminal message, Carolyn, that that uh, Senator Nelson is just too old to be reelected, which is kind of strange since he's about the same age as the president of the United States, who in 2020, you know, we may be up for re-election. But um, what is what does the senator do with that? How does he counteract that? I think he just keeps to continue praising Gillum and say, thank God he's on the ticket because he's gotten some live support and people might just go right down the ticket and bring him along. He has been around for quite a bit of time and he should be grooming someone to, you know, take his seat. But I, at the same time, I think he has this lifeline that he just needs to hold on to and, and, and run with it. So isn't that interesting? Gillum, who had polled last, made a surprise, come from behind. Now he has coattails. And Bill Nelson really needs to have a motivated Democratic base because this uh, Senate race has really been locked in place for months and months. M very few undecideds, again, back to those polls that we were discussing earlier. And so he really needs motivated Democrats to come out and vote for him. Does, uh, you know, his uh, Governor Scott's close relationship with the president is does president trump play into this race somehow he plays into this race and senator nelson will try to make sure that president trump plays into this race understand the scott campaign so far has operated under the principle of yes we're facing headwinds but our candidate can create his own weather patterns so far that's been true and as an example to tie in the toxic algae issue the the governor's campaign and the national republican senatorial committee are funding floating billboards being dragged behind boats off of Miami Beach right now, blaming Senator Bill Nelson for the toxic algae crisis. Really? Yes. Have you seen those? No, I haven't seen them. It's been a rainy weekend, though. It's a bad weekend. <laughs> that, that's, that's true. What do you think? The, the president inserting himself, either intentionally or not, into the Senate race? I, I think he did from the very get-go. I mean, supporting... Um, uh, his candidate right away you've just you know that the president um is on the ballot he really is on on our ballot although no matter the, what although the governor really hasn't brought him up hasn't really inserted him into the race at all well he yeah. it's not going to help him he doesn't really he doesn't need to do that i mean he didn't have a competitive primary the way desantis did where having the president's support really made a really made a big difference for desantis but make no mistake uh Trump is going to be a major issue this fall. I mean, people, it, to a great extent, this election, both for U.S. Senate and for governor, is going to be a referendum on the president. All right, sit tight. We have, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And one thing that the president is not a part of is Miami-Dade's transportation decisions. And that was kind of interesting this week. We'll talk about that when we come right back. Welcome back to the Roundtable. A decision this week at Miami-Dade's Transportation Committee was uh, raising a lot of eyebrows because in this grand fight between do we do bus, do we do rail, a lot of people fighting for rail. That was promised 16 years ago. Carolyn, the answer is bus rapid transit, which is bus on steroids, kind of like rail in speed and efficiency, they say. Right. They're, the buses will have dedicated lanes that people can uh, board at platform level. So you won't have to go up and down stairs. Again, saving time. You can buy your tickets beforehand. But that's not what the people asked for. They asked for rail. And, and not only what the people asked for. I mean, let, just uh, for some details, it's $243 million for 20 miles from an extension from Dayland to Florida City, a major commuter route. And that was not only what they asked for, but what was promised when the funding for it, the half penny sales tax. tax, was voted in 16 years ago. Yeah, the county commission is a group of unwitting thieves. They're just Ouch. not very they're not very good at keeping their promises. Now, whether they're intentionally stupid or they are intentionally deceiving people, I'll leave to them. But as you said, in 02, this is how people voted. And we were talking earlier at the break, like 
one of the things that they're citing for not giving rail, for not keeping their promise, is like, oh, people aren't using rail. Well, that's because the rail kind of goes nowhere, and it's never fulfilled its promise. It's like, if you actually give people the option of a real integrated rail system, you're going to start to see more users. And by the way, my daughter uses the rail system every morning, in part to get her to school, and it is fun, actually. <laughs> uh, when it, and, and fun is so critical when it comes to mass transit. <laughs> if, you, if you believe that there's not going to be a traffic problem if you're in a bus in a special lane in South Dade, that is, let's just add that as another deception in the false promise category because it's going to happen. Let's, let's carry that deception a little further. I wonder what the, what, how they would have voted had they had to vote before the primary election because all three incumbent county commissions, they walked right back into their seats. And you, you know, it kind of bubbled to the surface as this whole kind of thing played out was the fact that all of this money that was supposed to be from the sales tax promised for upgrades and rail and expansion was actually used for maintenance and to plug holes all of these and for years salaries. and for salaries for all of yeah. these years and let's bring Broward into this conversation Broward voters are going to be asked to do something very similar right there's an uh, this is interesting from a Broward perspective because there's a sales tax in a referendum on the November ballot for transportation in Broward County. And every time I hear about issues and problems with that Dade referendum from years ago and how the money didn't go for what it was promised, I keep thinking, what are voters in Broward who are seeing this discussion going to think about when it comes to their, uh, have, their proposed have you, tax have increase? Have you done reporting on that yet? Do you, have you asked voters? Do you have a sort of a handle on that yet? No, it's just a theory that it is going to have some negative spillover. The, and Broward just... Uh, Broward voters decided to uh, raise their taxes a bit to give teachers raises. And pretty pretty overwhelmingly, about 60% uh, for that. But of course, uh, for teacher salaries and school security, it was kind of like motherhood and apple pie on the ballot. So I mean, that was a very persuasive argument. And there were a lot of Democrats voting in that yeah, uh, and primary as, on as Tuesday. A, as the husband of a teacher in Miami-Dade, uh, I am always very suspicious of the idea that the bureaucracy is eventually going to have those resources reach the classroom, but we'll see. Well, you know what was interesting about the, we had Superintendent Runzi and the, and the board chair in the run up to framing out this appeal to voters to go ahead and raise their taxes. And the, the sell was about school security and that was an overarching theme of everything in the wake of what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, but the bulk of that tax raise and the bulk of the revenue coming from it, Carolyn, is going to be for teachers. Correct. And in Miami-Dade, that argument would be flip, right? Because the cost of living is just so out of whack with what they earn. So I believe Carvalho will probably push the fact that teachers can't afford housing, teachers can't afford transportation. He's going to probably up play the fact that the money is going to teachers and well, less they, to yeah, that, the district is going is rolling out at what they're calling an awareness campaign but you for first-hand oh, insider yeah. knowledge that you have well I, actually back to Broward I am really surprised that Runcie had that sort of juice this guy gave totally misleading statements to the Sun Sentinel about school security and Nicholas Cruz's background of uh, the, the shooter at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and then he was able to sell a tax increase that's pretty impressive All right, so you're giving him the credit for selling the tax increase. well I'm just surprised that he d isn't more of a liability than his record suggests he should be and for well let's bring it back to transportation now now that we have uh, 20 mile well we still need federal money do we not um, yes, we. For the, I'm talking about for the Miami Dade's extension. Is there still hoops to jump through? There still needs to be hundred million dollars from federal money coming in. There still need. I think the county still needs to actually allocate the money for it. Right, because they really don't have the money. However, you know they're using the argument to give the buses to say that oh, um, 243 is much better than 1.8 billion. Well. 1.8 billion might actually give the people what they really want. Um, I think there's a lot of giveaways and a lot of money going to other things, a lot of museums, that we could probably come up with the funds to give the people what they... What do, you, what do we spend too much money on? 
Well, that's a good question. I'd have to go through the budget. That's a whole other segment. Yeah, we do spend a lot of money on meringue and not pie, though. <laughs> meringue is actually my favorite pie. Okay, a lot of money on <laughs> sizzle and not steak. How about that? Mark Caputo, Tony Mann, Carolyn Gunnis, thanks so much for being in here on a really rainy Sunday. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. All right.